And we're Chrissy and Kyle, and we're here and we're chatting with Eric Woods from Firecracker Press. And we're going to chat about pricing today. That's our plan. We don't really have much more of a plan than that, other than no. the conversation <laughs> is going to revolve around pricing in some fashion. It's something that we get asked a lot. A lot of artists, I think at kind of every stage of the game, even us sometimes for certain things, don't know what we're doing when it comes to pricing. For example, we got asked to price for a design job for a brewery and we had no idea how to do that because there isn't like a really like step-by-step follow-along guide or where you can like go into a store and be like ah oh, milk generally costs x so so yeah we thought we would just have a nice little chat so yeah we thought we would just have a nice little chat yeah well thanks for having me i appreciate it so yeah, I can kind of just introduce myself a little bit and talk a little bit about what we do here. Um, so my name is Eric Woods. I'm the owner of the Firecracker Press. Uh, we're a letterpress print shop and design shop in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, turn of the year here, right after the holidays, we'll be celebrating our 20th anniversary here. Kind of crazy. It's the longest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah, it's hard to believe. But um, like I said, we're a letterpress print shop and a design shop. We design and print posters for people. We design and print Wedding invitations. Right now, we're right in the midst of all the holiday season stuff. So, you know, a lot of greeting cards. Uh, we do a line or several lines of cards for ourselves that we sell on a retail basis. You know, we do custom work for folks as well. And then we kind of do a little bit of everything in between in a way, as long as it's letterpress printing and as long as it's paper related, you know, it doesn't always fall into the categories of posters or stationary necessarily. Um, we're working on a big project right now with the St. Louis Blues. Uh, we're doing like uh, trading cards uh, oh, for featured cool. players. So those are coming out quarterly. And the plan right now is to do four. We're working on our second one right now and designing the third. Kind of have to get designed well in advance of actual production. So those are pretty exciting. And, you know, they're kind of like mini posters in a way. They're uh, very much similar to like, you know, those kind of like who, what, when, and where, quick, yeah, yeah. bold graphic kind of uh, those are a lot of fun. It's sort of an unusual project for us, but we, we love working with these folks and um, uh, we've done a lot of work with them in the past. So continuing there as well. So the business has like, it's the shop and, but it, like, does the nonprofit is, are they connected or are they totally separate entities? They are, right? Uh, well, a little bit of both, the, you know, uh, from a governmental structure, it, totally different, uh, right. totally separate. Um, so you're talking about central print central mm -hmm. print was born out of the firecracker press, um, things that we were doing sort of in the early two thousands, uh, 2010s that really fell under a nonprofit umbrella, but were being done out of a for-profit shop. So workshops, uh, tours, internships, education stuff. We eventually decided we wanted to start a second location because firecracker was really growing. We found a space that we couldn't fill. <laughs> Even if we wanted a second space for Firecracker, we needed to do something more to activate the space. Right. And so uh, it was good timing to roll the nonprofit things we were doing into a nonprofit structure. And that's kind of how uh, Central Print was born. At one time, our second location was back to back in the same building as Central Print. Uh, as time has developed, Central Print has really grown as well and uh, really grew into the space that was Firecracker's second location. We're separate entities uh, and in separate locations. One is on the north side and one's on the south side of town. So, you know, we work very closely together on a lot of behind the scenes stuff. A lot of things that, you know, aren't Instagrammable or, <laughs> you know, don't get to sort of see the light of day in a social sense, but right. the light of day in programming sense and sort of development and that kind of thing. Okay. So maybe, I don't know if there'll be time, but like maybe we'll start with the Firecracker Press because I think that for the most part, folks are probably like if they're makers, they're making and they want to like think about how to ensure that they're profitable in their making life. Probably fewer people of a much smaller niche are interested in, in like what the not-for-profit world looks like. And I know that like for us, the structure of a not-for-profit is probably quite different in Canada than it is in the States, you know, from a government perspective and all of the bureaucracy that comes with being a not-for-profit is like a whole beast unto itself. I think like a question that comes up a lot for us is just like the baseline of how do you even get started when you're like, Let's think about like maybe because you have sort of different pillars of your business, right? So maybe if we start with like the retail side. So you're making, you have an idea. You're like, I want to make this greeting card and I, and I would love for people to buy it. That would be cool. 
do you, <laughs> I know when we first started, <laughs> we kind of just made them and we didn't think about like what paper we were using and, you know, how many to make and where do they go and what are the materials? I don't know if like, if it was like similar for you or if you always kind of had like a, your bearings, cause you had a bit more of a design startup than we did. We went to like fine art school. We were making like installations that were not saleable and didn't even consider that part of the, the art yeah. world. But then we graduated and we realized we need to make a living. Yeah, it's, the <laughs> bank's like when you pay your mortgage with money. It's super weird. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the retail side of it um, came after some time. I mean, um, when we first opened the shop, we were definitely doing custom design and printing work uh, okay. for most folks. Uh, very much behind the scenes in a studio space that wasn't necessarily open to the public or uh, accessible from the street. And that sort of was always a desire from the beginning, but never was a, a reality that we could tackle necessarily. It took some time for that to develop. And we developed that really in a, in a rental space. We eventually found a sort of a street level rental space and began uh, designing stuff for ourselves, really. You know, like, what do we want to see? What do we want to, what would we like to see in a shop if we went into it? And how do we exercise some of these odd feelings that we've got about different things? And you know, just that sort of that creative side. Uh, so sales weren't necessarily ever first and foremost. It was really kind of like just an exercise in a lot of ways. Eventually, we bought a building in a commercial district that has a retail front and started to develop that more. And I would say it really sort of started to kind of, I guess, somewhat become more mature uh, with that, you know, with opening the store to the public and having regular hours and, you know, that kind of thing. Um Picking paper, pricing things out, uh, packaging, you know, is a big thing that we didn't think about in the beginning. You know, how does, how does something survive on a store shelf with people handling it without you losing all the components or having to go back every day, clean the store and put things back together after people have gone through them. So that kind of like end user experience was something that um, actually I'm still working on, quite frankly. The solve for that uh, cleanliness was plastic sleeves. And I absolutely deplore them. I hate them. Same um, with us. I completely relate. Yeah, single-use plastic. I mean, they're not made for anything else except to hold a card. And once you buy that card, you throw that plastic yeah. sleeve away. I don't even know. They're probably not even recyclable, to be honest with you. So we started about three years ago saying no more plastic sleeves. We're still going through the stock of plastic sleeves that we had prior to that, quite frankly. I mean, it's something that we've kind of worked through that inventory. But once that's done, I'm hoping that we find a real good solution for that because it's just not cool. It's an expense that we didn't consider either at the beginning. The reason we picked plastic sleeves eventually was because we were at a sale and someone dropped a coffee from like an that elevation isn't. above us and it went yeah. on all of our stuff. And it was like, we just lost all that, all of it. Like the whole stock that was on the table at the craft sale, gone. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, people you know at events will bring beers around and that kind of thing. And eventually they slosh onto things. But it, plastic's so easy. I mean, the, the sleeves are sold in a multitude of sizes. They're fairly inexpensive from a packaging standpoint. You can really work that into your price pretty easily. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a devilish thing. But And you know what? Quite frankly, they're very clean. Uh, it looks really nice. I think it looks very professional to have yourself your, your stuff in a nice plastic sleeve that's kind of shiny, but we're, we're working away from that. I'm hoping we can find a solution with um, like a paper bag or a glassine bag or something like that. So we'll see. But that's kind of how we got into retail. And, um, you know, even, even though we do have a, a fair amount of inventory, retail's always been sort of third tier for us in a lot of ways. Um, okay. I call it icing on the cake. You know, it's not necessarily something that, you know, like we don't do a whole lot of wholesale. You know, if we're making something to sell in a retail sense, we're generally selling it through our own outlet, either online or at the store. But, you know, it's not, I don't know. There are a lot of folks out there that do it a lot better than we do and really do it as a focus. Mm -hmm. We've always just kind of had it as a nice thing when people come to the store. They can kind of hang out and look around and and buy some merchandise. Not that it hasn't been a good revenue generator for us. It has really been custom work for clients uh, where we can really get our teeth into a project and sort of work uh, with individual organizations is really where we where we really make our money and where we, I think, really uh, can innovate and do a lot of fun things. So how do you navigate you know, that world? Well, I think that comes out of a graphic design discipline, you know, having clients finding out their needs, uh, tackling problems visually, and then finding a way to produce that. Uh, so it's a tangible good. I really love the, when I'm working with somebody that is, you know, when we're really gelling, 
from a client design shop relationship. I, there's just nothing like that. I think it's really uh, quite lovely. Uh, you'll hear nightmares, and we've had our own of you know terrible clients that were you know just a wreck. But when it works, it really works really well. And I find that we work well to be inspired that way, you know, mm-hmm. to to get our creativity rolling. And we've built a system, I think, where people come to us because they like what we do, they respect what we do. And in a sense, it weeds out the nasties before they hit the door. It doesn't always work. Uh, people sometimes surprise you, you know, but for the most part, I think we're really fortunate that people are coming to the shop because they want something that we produce and they appreciate what we do. Um, which I, you know, wasn't always the case when we were just strictly working for other design shops. There was really this attitude of the designer does what the client wants because the client is paying for it and the customer is always right. So don't ask a lot of questions, just go make it pretty. And that doesn't, that never sat well with me then. It doesn't sit well with me now. I think it's our job as creative people, especially as designers, to really push back against stupid ideas, quite frankly. Um, I for it to be cl- more of a collaboration and not just like a, you're my employee. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't go to your mechanic and tell them how to fix your car. You know, I, I use that analogy a lot. Um, you go to your mechanic and you trust that they're, they're doing the right thing. If you don't trust them, then you go find another mechanic. And we work very well. We work, we work very well in that regard. Like, People come to us because they trust us. I think I really do believe that if we're not a good fit for you, there are a million designers out there that you can go to that are probably, quite frankly, a lot cheaper than we are that will do exactly what you tell them to do. So we don't run into that too much. We did in the beginning, occasionally. Uh, We don't really run into that too much anymore, thankfully. As coming from a non-design background, how do you guys go about like even beginning to like throw together a quote? Like if somebody comes in, is there like a pricing board on the wall that says a one color screen print at 12 by 18 is this price? Well, it definitely two, would be three. screen print, but yeah. Not a press. <laughs> we do screen print. That's where my mind is. But like, you know, like sure. do you have like a like a stock price sheet or is it always like a custom quote? Like how do you arrive to that position with your client? Uh, we put together custom quotes for everything we do. And we have some systems in place that help us to kind of arrive at a number. To use a sort of an analogy from the trades, if you hire a contractor or a carpenter to come over and do something to your house, you know, the, you're going to you're gonna tell them what you need. I need a banister on my stairs and I'd like it to look like this. What do you think? Um, we'll talk about materials. We'll talk about timeline. And eventually they're going to come back with a custom quote. They've got a formula somewhere that they're using to kind of come up with this based on materials and time. But at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're kind of calculating from experience what um, what they think it's going to take. There's always a little bit of what it's worth, you know, like the steps on your house probably don't take that long to construct. And, you know, the materials might not be all that expensive, but because it's your house, because it's going to last for the next 30 years or 50 years or 100 years, you know, like there's this this elevation of value there that maybe if they put steps in your garage or your chicken coop or wherever else, they're going to, they're going to that cost because that might be a more temporary structure. So there's, there's definitely formula involved. There's definitely some um, gray area as well. I think that help to sort of arrive at a, at a fair cost. Are there like mistakes that you made early on that you can be like, this definitively was not the right way to go about formulating Mm. a price for a client? Uh, You know, we had some trouble in the very beginning collaborating with other designers, Um, other designers that really appreciated what we were doing. When you say that, do you mean like people submitting images to you and then you carving and printing them? Submitting images or submitting sort of half-baked ideas and saying, hey, do you want to work together on this project? I love what you guys do. Can I contribute a little bit and you guys contribute a little bit? And then we arrive at something that is a real collaboration for both of us. And, you know, that's really, I found out that's more uh, code for, I love what you do and I want to learn how to do it. I want to be a part of it, but I really want you to do what I want, not necessarily what you're bringing to the table, you know, like, so we don't work that way anymore. (laughs) Um, if, If you want us to do something the way that we do it, we work two ways, I guess. If you want us to do something the way that we do it, hire us to do it from scratch, you know, or you bring us a fully baked idea and we will execute it for you. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to work on a half done or 75% done project and kind of finish it out for you and add some flourishes and maybe kind of like shape it up. We just don't work that way anymore. I love working collaboratively, but I don't like working in that regard where like, here's a drawing that I really like, but can you make it better? Like we just don't do that kind of stuff. Fair enough. Yeah. I feel like we've, we had some, 
like early on when we, we were like, you know, fresh out of school, we just wanted to get people in the door. I feel like there were a few times where, you know, somebody was like having an event or doing a whatever. They were like, can you, can we like run it like a workshop where we come in, we pay you like workshop time. We sort of build something together and then we print it together at like a workshop dollar amount. And, you know, we'll bring sure. in a, our team of people and so that things will get done faster and I think yeah I think in my head I thought oh this is not only am I going to be like learning I think it was a good actual skill in learning how to teach I don't think it was necessarily like a bad learning experience for us as like new shop owners but I think from like a making it worth it it was definitely a failure if I saw it only as like an educational experience primo education um, in like running a workshop, facilitating, you know, seeing someone's vision and trying to, like you're saying, like trying to help them bring it to light in a really like clean and, you know, well executed way. But from like a cost place, it was just always a failure because like, you know, things like that I didn't consider, like the fact that like, if you bring a bunch of people in that don't know anything about printmaking, the like volume of material is going to increase exponentially because there's going to be a lot of mistakes. Uh, as they're learning to do something they don't know how to do. And usually in a workshop scenario, you're eating the cost of those mistakes because they're paying for a workshop. They're not paying for paper and ink and screens and stencils and et cetera, et cetera. That's like built into the workshop cost. And so, you know, like those kinds of mistakes were things that I just, I just like honestly didn't think about (laughs) until we did it a few times and we were like, whoa, nope. Well, you're you're right. I think I, you, uh, creative types, I think, are naturally collaborative people generally. I mean, we've all got ideas that we want to see come to fruition, but I would hate to think that someone would classify me as like not a team player. You know, like if we were to get together as a, as a, a three piece, uh, I'd like for that to be a band, you know, like uh, <laughs> that's, al- that's always my uh, hope. But I think we learned early on where to draw the line as far as, you know, really how to define that term of collaboration we're doing what we're doing at firecracker because i want to do it you know like it's not i'm here to get my kicks at the end of the day like we've got to either i figured out we've got to either do it from scratch like i said or i'm happy to work behind the scenes and just be your production person for your idea that's fully baked um i think that just works for what we're doing here at the shop a lot better you mentioned like carving somebody else's image i mean that in and of itself i think is a good sort of illustration how things can go wrong you know somebody designs something on the screen mm-hmm. and it's everything is perfect and everything's where it needs to be and then we get that transferred to wood and you get the natural idiosyncrasies that come with wood grain and knots and organic materials like that's sometimes very difficult to describe or predict and so again as long as we're able to get it from scratch then we can deliver all the multitude of steps that need to happen before it actually leaves the door and make sure that we're steering those all in the right place. So that, right. Um, looks great. A very conscious choice of ours early on, and we talk about this a lot, was like keeping our overhead insanely low so that we could, I guess, feel more secure in the fact that like we do run a business structure that is a little bit precarious. You know, we we know there's certain jobs that we'll probably participate in every year, but in a lot of cases, and even with the residency, you know, sometimes we would have, you know, 50 people come stay with us in a year and sometimes we would have 80 and sometimes those people would be staying for really long periods of time which meant that the earnings from that was much less than if people were staying for like a week after a week after a week and so there was always like for us these kind of like big fluctuations in cash flow for you having like you're renting a site that is not your home you know it's like you have this retail space that you have staff or you did have staff I don't know how the pandemic has factored into that landscape do you sort of come at every month saying like, we need to get X number of jobs at X amount of money in order to like cover the base costs of us staying operational. Is that yeah. a weird question uh, to ask? <laughs> no, that's not a weird, I mean, that's a perfect question to ask. Well, one thing, uh, we own our building. Um, oh. Yeah, we got, got out of the, um, you know, we were renting a storefront at one time and then we ended up realizing that, you know, we were spending a lot of money just on the space. And, you know, like, depending on what you're doing, that's exactly it. Like, if you're in a real high traffic area, and your rent is X amount of dollars, then you really got to churn and burn, you know, you got to like, you got to be selling stuff um, in order just to afford the space. So we bought a building with the idea that eventually it'd be ours. And that has been a really good it's been a really good thing for us as far as the overhead goes. You know, it, it depends on how big your staff is and it depends on a lot of things. 
we had a number at one time, you know, like when it was me and two other people, that's a certain number. When it's me and six people, that's a different number. When we moved to a second location, everything got ratcheted up. The temperature went up and like that was a situation where we had to be producing. And honestly, I don't remember what it was, but I do remember the stress of, you know, going out and finding that kind of work and and, and making sure the machines were running. So that has fluctuated over the years. You're right. I mean, COVID has definitely affected us as far as staff goes. Turn of the year will be 20 years for us. And I'm at a point right now where I am really, really happy with it being small. I'm really, really happy with being able to put my design hat on for a couple of hours and then jump over to the press and put my printer hat on for a couple of hours and then move back and do the financial side of things for a little bit. It's not something that I can sustain for the rest of my life. You know, it's it's a lot of juggling here and there, but I do have uh, absolute control over everything. And right now that's really, really satisfying for us. So despite the fact that COVID has changed things, I think we found a silver lining in um, running things very small and still, you know, keeping a lot of work going through here. So we'll see how long that lasts. You mentioned the dips, of, you know, having 60 people in or 80 people in, you know, like we run those dips too. And it's for us, it's a slow month or a slow quarter versus a really intense uh, month or really intense quarter. And so that, that roller coaster has never really changed. Uh, I think I've gotten more used to it, mm-hmm. but the roller coaster of running a, a small business is everlasting. I had a gentleman one time say like, well, who are your, where's your bread and butter? You know, like, um, what are the clients that are really bringing in the work that you can hang everything else on? You can experiment with these weird projects because you've got this one that you do every month and we're 20 years in and I, we've never had a bread and butter, uh, client. We've got clients that repeat, but we're not like a law firm where we put people on retainer, you know, and know that that money's going to be there and then make business decisions based on that, that pocket of money. Mm -hmm. So no, that's like so true. We've been listening to like a lot of like uh, kind of business gurus talking about like how to run a shop and like that expression like you, know, you got to just learn what your crank is and you turn your crank and like that's how you make your money. You just like you need money, you turn that crank. And, like that doesn't exist in the arts. I mean, it does. <laughs> I'm sure for some people, but yeah, it's so, not like, the way for that... most people. I don't feel like it exists. I think of it a lot like being in a band. You know, like you can book your gigs out a little bit in advance, but eventually you just got to hit the road. Mm-hmm. And one gig to another gig, you know, you start out in San Francisco and you go up to Seattle and the next thing you know, you're in Vancouver, you know, like I didn't expect to be here, but this is pretty cool. And hopefully that takes you around the world if that's what you want to do. And we've been lucky in that regard. I say to a lot of folks, like good work brings good work. Working really hard and producing something that you love, for us at least, has been a good formula for turning out another job. One one job brings another. Do you actively, well, I'm, I'm sure that over the 20 years, this has changed a lot. So maybe we can like, talk a little bit about the history of this question. Finding people to work with, how? what's the structure of that for you? Do you cold call people? Do you seek people out? Or maybe that was the foundation or maybe it's changed or like, yeah, I guess like, how has that process worked for you? Um, that has always been a real artful process for us. I would never consider that to be like a sales call kind of situation. Even in the beginning, I mean, in the beginning, I guess we did try a couple of sales calls here and there, and some of those might have actually come to fruition. But, you know, in the very beginning, we were working for people that we knew already. We did uh, some of our first business was uh, business cards for art galleries, um, wedding oh. invitations for friends of friends, you know, posters for arts organizations uh, here in St. Louis and, and elsewhere. And, you know, it started really slowly. It started very organically. Even pre-internet, uh, there was this notion of just turning it on and being a rock star, especially when you're young, you know, and and being that person that everybody kind of looks up to is like this, uh, oh my gosh, how did he do it kind of, you know, situation. Yeah. And that's never been the situation for us. <laughs> you know, if you see the curve of somebody's career, just kind of take off like that. Our curve has always been kind of like this, you know, it's and it's steady. still that way. and it's slow and it's steady. And um, sometimes we hit a high and, and then that's awesome. But it has meant that we don't have to stress out too much about finding work. That was different when we started the second location mm-hmm. that we really started trying to push sales and that sort of thing. It just wasn't a good fit for us. It wasn't comfortable. And uh, we weren't finding the kind of work that we wanted to do through those channels so we stopped doing it. Right now, every project we've got in-house has come to us organically through word of mouth. Over 20 years, you're right, that has changed. Over 20 years, that word of mouth is a little bit, I wouldn't say easier necessarily, but the name, I think, and the, the brand, I guess, of what we do is a little bit more well-known. And so 
there's maybe a little less education at the front end or uh, justification of why you should hire us. And it's, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, somebody's going to be listening to this saying, oh my gosh, that just, that seems like a fairy tale. And it's so much not, it's so much not that. I mean, it's really just, you know, we did some coasters for this brewery and uh, they really liked them. And so six months later, when they were opening a new retail shop, they asked us to do a line of seven different retail pro- products that they could put in their brewery. And th- that's a calendar and that's a set of coasters and that's um, a growler for a special edition kind of, you know, like, and then that somebody goes to that, that retail shop and sees, buys one of those growlers and takes it home and reads the label in the back and they see our website. And then they pop onto our, our, our website and order a poster, you know, like it's really as simple as that. I, you know, I'm, I love data and I love, you know, being able to back things up with facts and figures and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, it's not really how we're making decisions here at Firecracker. So with central yeah. print then, like mm-hmm. kind of going back to the like um, knowing knowing those like banks of money that you're going to be able to sort of like rest your head on. You, the Lady of Letterpress conference, is that mm-hmm. one of those for that? Like, do you sort of say, okay, we can guarantee, generally speaking, that like X number of people are going to attend this event and each one of those ticket sales is blank and we're paying out blank for this, these speakers to come. Like, I'm assuming like, that's like probably a good example of being like, this is a thing we do every year and we have enough data now to feel fairly confident. <laughs> yeah. Well, you would think <laughs> one might think that, um, I hope that's the perception from the outside. It's the perception it that I have. <laughs> Uh, you know, like Ladies of Letterpress, we've gotten very involved with Ladies of Letterpress uh, through the conference, and it's been in St. Louis here, both at Firecracker and Central Print. Uh, I've got, goodness gracious, maybe four or five times live, and then when COVID hit, now we've done it twice, all virtual. I actually attended Ladies of Letterpress as a speaker in Iowa when Printers Hall was hosting up in uh, Mount Pleasant, and just had a really fantastic time. Met a really a lot of really great people. Love the vibe of it just being pretty chill and like the idea of it being very workshop based and education based. I also love the idea that you know it's very female driven. As that has sort of that's sort of where the industry, as far as letterpress goes, I think that's kind of the lion's share of operators. <laughs> I love to say because letterpress was such a male dominated, yeah. male driven industry, printing especially, you know. So today to see women picking it up and uh, using it in a much more craft uh, fashion and, you know, being producers in and of themselves. But uh, I just love that notion and it's something I really want to support. And so we started talking to Ksenia about maybe bringing parts of the conference here. And with Central Print being built out and having the facilities there, it just became a really natural place to host. Again, very organic, like first year, not knowing how it would go. Yeah. Second year at each other and saying, do we want to do this again? Yeah. Okay. Third year coming around like, Oh wait, this might be something we might be, we might be getting kind of serious here and just kind of continuing from there. It's a great thing. It, it was a great thing in person. I love it when people from other countries come to St. Louis for the ladies of Letterpress press conference. <laughs> it just it boggles my mind. Uh, and, you know, having people travel to us. And then when everything went online, just to see people from all over the world attending virtually folks that wouldn't have been able to get on a plane or make the trip, but can now come and take part it was very satisfactory. It is. It's a wonderful event. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being a part of it this year. Love having you guys in the business panel. And, um, you know, we're we're actually sitting down here pretty soon to talk about uh, 2022 and what we're going to do. Ladies of Letterpress is just kind of one component of Central Print, though. You know, like when I introduce myself, it depends on the group that I'm talking to. But I'm, I'm the owner of the Firecracker Press. I'm the founder of Central Print and now former board chair. Uh, we've just elected a new board chair and we're sort of moving into a new uh, structure there. And I'm one of the conference planners for the Ladies of Letterpress. So, you know, from a, a, from a resume standpoint, I, I like those sort of like bullet points. All of those things just have just kind of developed through experience and time and effort and organically. I don't know. It's hard to, hard to really look back on it and uh, pinpoint any one particular thing that like drove this thing to go this direction, but I feel like it's, it's all to that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, it, I want to make sure that everybody understands that there's also a lot of intent behind all of it too. I, 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 I don't want to come off as being sort of willy nilly about the whole thing or casual about it at all. I mean, I, I sit up all night thinking about these things, you know, like <laughs> uh, at the same time though, I tell everybody like, you got to be yourself. You can't go out there and pretend to be anybody else. And you got to run things the way that you want to see them run. Otherwise go work for somebody else. You'll make more money doing it. 
it's got to be it's got to be something from your heart and who you are. You've got to be um, a contributor, I think, um, in that regard. Just to kind of on an individual sort of cosmic basis, you know, like there's no one in the world that is you. There's no one in the world that can do what you do. Mm-hmm. So you need to find the space and the time and the place to go out and do that thing, whatever that is. If that's protesting, you know, march in the streets. If that's making posters for protests, make posters for protests. You know, just be a part of the action in, in some regard. I think we feel like really similar about how, like, I guess, like Chrissy and I just always, it's just been us. Like people have asked, like, what are you guys going to do when you like retire? And we're like, hey, first off, we can't retire. We don't make enough money. <laughs> do not have a retirement plan. Just speaking of finance, none. I was in my 20s, 20s, late 20s. 23, 24, maybe? was the first time I went to an SGC conference. I got us a table. Sparkbox was like fresh. Like we were like, we hadn't like fully moved into this house yet or we just moved into this house yeah i went and was sitting beside somebody from new york i some shop they were like i don't think that they were the owner they were like somebody that worked in a shop they were talking to me about like the structure of our business you know i was like well kyle and i run it we're a for-profit like we definitely like i can relate to what you're saying about like having a business that definitely functions in a completely not for profit fashion, but is under a for profit status. This guy was like, oh, you need, here's what you need to do. And he like gave me this, like, it was the like coldest version of running an arts organization. It was like so systematic, so like uh, all the personality, all the love, all the passion for like making this like little nugget of joy for yourself. Just strip that out, get rid of it. Make two pillars, make one of them like this, get an intern, you know, like structure your house in this way. I was like, what are you talking about? But I mean, I think realistically, like from a business standpoint, it was really solid advice. Like if I could take my like, I don't want, I don't want to say need for control, but I mean, probably that's what it is. But like, if I felt like I could like completely strip myself from Sparkbox, this person's plan of like, find a school that has a program that like creates like people that want to be into like curation or whatever, put a gallery on the property, segment the business so that the residency and the gallery are not for profit, but the printing side is for profit. You run that as an employee, you have a board, you get the school to give you an intern that runs the residency in the gallery. At the same time, you give them a place to live, then you don't have to pay them because they're going to be getting school credit. They get a lot on their resume. You run the commercial under the print shop, run workshops there. I was like, yeah, you know, from like a money making perspective, this but makes it sense. Out, to, the suggestion takes out like any of any of the soul that which I think is like what I've always loved about Sparkbox. Like Sparkbox Studio is Chrissy and I. When we ask people like, what is it about your experience here that was like really wonderful, like a past resident? And it's usually us. It's not like it's not like necessarily the space or the environment. It's like the connections that you make, the people, the person makes the business. And like, I feel like you're the same. Like yeah. the reason, like part of the reason that like Firecracker is what it is, is because you love what you're doing and people love being a part of that. And like being like, look at this beautiful thing that got made by this person that is like super qualified, super passionate, and just like on point with this whole production, with all of it. Yeah. You know, I think that kind of structure existed a lot more I'm, I'm assuming it, it, it existed a lot more in the past than it does today it's tough to run a business with just two people it's tough to run a you know a business on your own we, you know we've crossed the threshold sometimes throughout those 20 years where we're all sort of sitting around the room looking at each other asking ourselves like you know this is all great but why are we doing this you know like um those kind of questions generally come up with salaries you know or uh benefits or uh, annual reviews, you know, those kind of things where, you know, uh, you can't have people working for you that are just there because they're really passionate about it. If you've got people working for you, you've got to pay them a living wage. You know, you've got to pay them a living wage. You've, you've got to offer them some sort of benefits and you've got to somewhat be competitive with the marketplace out there, you right. know, and uh, you were talking about paying your mortgage. Like, yeah, you've got to, you actually got to do that with money. You can't do that with barter or the fruit basket that you gathered at the market, you know, like it's got to be the real deal. So your, your friend that met you at SGC and kind of gave you this plan, like sounds like a really good plan <laughs> and ha- having a plan is good. It's not enough to be really passionate about something. It's not enough to uh, really want something really, 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 really bad. You know, like we do, we did have to cross the threshold of developing a pricing structure very early on. 
in the firecracker press history. We have stuck to that pricing structure even still today. You know, it's something that we, we developed and that's been tweaked and changed. But I see our art making process, posters, uh, invitations, stationery, whatever it is, sort of being akin to the financial side of it. We, I try to run the financial side of it as much like an art project as possible. If you look at it from a QuickBooks spreadsheet, numbers kind of like that shit will just keep you crazy all the time. It does me at least. And so I have to look forward to it and I have to treat it like it's art. And so that's kind of what we do in a lot of ways. That's our plan is to try to treat everything like an art project and, 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 you know, try to make it as enjoyable for us individual. What does that mean exactly? I'm very curious. It's abstract in a lot of ways, but I've got to figure out ways of working in that world that are intriguing to me. I'm a visual person. So I try to set up things very visually. From so the like financial if I side. came to you and I was like, okay, I want to make a spark box poster. I want to be a wood block and I want an addition of 500, one color. Mm-hmm. How do you make that visual from a, um, from a quote perspective? From a quote perspective. <laughs> For me, my estimating process is a very visual process. So I have a very particular way about writing those quotes out. Um, we have a very particular way about presenting those quotes to the clients. Um, those don't necessarily correspond with the uh, uh, spreadsheet software that's out there. Those don't necessarily correspond to the bookkeeping software that's out there. Um, I've tried to plug it into those things, but those two systems don't always talk very well. And so the one I do takes a lot more time. The one I do is not very efficient uh, in that regard. And I can't, even 20 years in, I can't just give you a quote right now. Like if you said 500, one color, 13 by 19, how much is that going to cost me? I have no idea. And I can't just go to the calculator and come up with that really quickly. I have to sit down and go through that visual process every time in order to achieve that number. That number eventually gets to the same place as it would if it were in a spreadsheet. And if it were in a formula, I've tested this against your formula. (laughs) And I'm happy to say that your formula goes about it completely differently, but we get to about the same place financially based on what we do and and, and, and what you guys do. So I there are like definitely things about books that aren't fun, you know, like oh, taxes yeah. aren't fun, you know, but I try to make as much of those things interesting to me uh, as possible so that I don't just procrastinate and put them off and not do them. You got to come to it eventually. It's true. <laughs> uh, I'm like kind of like the quoting it and stuff. Do you like think about pricing as like, Per, like per print or per color or per pull. I try to like break down when some, when I'm like working on a project, like I try to often break it down to like how much does this cost per pull? And I think that that seems to work really well as like a rough estimate. I can't remember what like our, our per pull was for our last project. This is, I think this is where things get tricky or I mean, I'll speak for us. I can't speak for everybody, but is that we have a formula. We, we, we share it happily with people and we have it for sale on our website we also kind of have like a bit of a sliding scale. Like there's certain projects, certain organizations that we know like cannot afford a certain amount per poll or like what they want to do, we're excited about. And so we will like, yeah, sort of shift the scope of what that's going to look like. So the project that Kyle's talking about, I think it ended up being like 50 cents a poll for a screen. Now they did all the design work, some, well, they didn't do it, but they hired someone to do the design work. So we were like literally just being printmakers. And that's something we don't do a lot, really. Uh, And so, and and the print was beautiful. Like it was clean, it was done by an illustrator that clearly like understood the process, which makes a really big difference because it means that like you get the image, it's sized to the size that they, you're not having to do any work you're just making a stencil, putting it on a screen and pulling the print. Yeah, so like that one we did 50 cents a pull. But then we also factored materials on top of that because we knew that it actually wasn't going to like, we would have been at a huge deficit if we didn't also charge for materials. We base our pricing structure on materials. Materials are always a big part of that. Um, materials costs change. And so our pricing structure changes with materials costs. That makes sense. Um, uh, so materials number of colors contributes to that especially when you're carving you know carving one block for one color versus three colors is a totally different amount of labor so we're basing it on the number of colors uh size is a big factor a business card from a real estate standpoint is much smaller of course than a larger poster and so uh size contributes and then the quantity you know um we try to get folks to produce uh an addition it might be a hundred pieces. If, if you had to like push me on a minimum, that might be a hundred. 
if it's business cards, we're going to try to get you to do 500, you know, anymore. People want 25 business cards, you know? And so small. That, well, you know, they're starting a new business. They don't know where it's going to go. They mm-hmm. want to just try it out. Need something to hand to a few people to see. And in a world where you can go get business cards for 99 cents, I'll take 25, you know, like whatever. So that gives us an opportunity to really kind of educate people on, you know, unit cost, labor. Let's do 500 because all the materials and all the time we're going to take to produce this, you might as well actually make a significant amount of these. Um, Does complexity of image factor in? Uh, not necessarily. You know, we do, it doesn't happen as much as it used to, but a lot of times people would kind of say, well, this is going to be really simple. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be expensive. I just did a project yesterday that is like the cleanest, simplest thing on earth. And it took me all day long, you know, like it doesn't necessarily mean because it looks simple on the page that it's actually simple to produce. Carving, you know, like here again, we're generally 99.99% of the time, if we're carving wood, we're designing from scratch. And so we know what's going into it as we're designing it. And we're kind of pushing it toward a particular amount of time and energy. Um, uh, complexity doesn't really, everything we do is complex, even if it looks simple in the end. And so that isn't really necessarily a factor for us. But we've found with materials, size, number of colors, and quantity, um, those are all flexible enough over time that as inflation takes over, you know, like there's a lot of talk about inflation these days. Yep. As much costs rise and as time and labor uh, costs increase, like we're able to use that formula uh, fairly timelessly without changing our pricing, you know, or without necessarily uh, adjusting too terrible much. I know a lot of letterpress printers used to charge by the um, plate change Mm. because the time it takes to take one color out and then set up the next, you know, is uh, fairly laborious versus sometimes the time it takes to actually print. You know, if you do posters, it might take you an hour to print 50 posters, but it might take you four hours to set that thing up. Um, so I think that historically there are structures out there from a sort of old school printer standpoint that take those kind of things into account. We don't necessarily do that. Um, we find that all that kind of gets absorbed in all those other bits and we've been pretty successful uh, with it. You know, I don't know how much things should cost. I, I hear a lot of people say that letterpress is really expensive. My wife and I have a joke that people don't pay us to produce posters. They pay us to struggle. <laughs> they don't know. That. They don't know that. Um, and I'll get really philosophical about this. It's the struggle that we put into the projects. That's the secret sauce. That's the magic that really gets revealed when it's all said and done. There's but, a really good chance. I'm just going to grab this little segment for Instagram because it's so good. and so true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like, um, is that expensive? You know, I don't know if you came and hung out with me for a week and you heard me cussing and kicking around and, you know, fiddling with this bit and repairing the press after this thing happened, you know, like maybe at the end of the day, I think the chances are you'd say, wow, I got a really good deal (laughs) on this thing compared to the online services where you can get things really cheaply and you don't have to talk to anybody. uh, Yeah, I'd say we're probably um, fairly expensive in that regard, but you know, when you take it just apples for apples, what we do, um, I think at the end of the day, we're probably underpriced, quite frankly. I mean, it's certainly a lot of struggle sometimes. We had a high school intern who was absolutely the best. She was just so wonderful. And she was with us when we had a big installation project. And part of the installation, we like, we letter pressed a bunch of birds. And then we didn't have a cricket at that time. So we hand cut them. There was like 500. And then we also made these like, basically like party decoration poofs, like tissue paper poofs. But we made like hundreds of them, like rooms full of this poof stuff. And so we got her making the poofs because they were like relatively easy and repeatable. And I was like, you can just watch Netflix and make poofs all day. Sure. And at one point she was like, this is, this is not fun. I was like, oh, <laughs> did you think that this was going to be fun? She was like, well, yeah, I kind of, yeah. And there's just so many, like, I don't understand why we're making so many. It's taking forever. I was like, yes, welcome to the arts. Like for yeah. people get to go to this installation. There's going to be lights. It's going to be kind of magical. It's going to feel really fun. They're going to be able to create great Instagram pictures. But the making of it, a lot of the time, is just the same. At, you're just hoping you don't get carpal tunnel. Um, <laughs> and you consume a lot of podcasts and 
television. Sure. But you know, that's really where the magic happens. I mean, all that struggle and all that, all that work uh, certainly showed, I'm sure, in the final, final piece. Nobody can put their thumb on why it's so special. You know, nobody can say like, oh, wow, this is really great because, you know, it's just you walk into the place and it's great. Yeah, and well, it feels good. Yeah. And you know what? Nobody has to know. Nobody has to know how much we sweat. Nobody has to know that. And I kind of like, I kind of like that being our little secret is that we really do sweat. Um, but when you show up and I give you the box and it's nicely wrapped, I, you know, at the end of the story, I'm always really happy. You know, I, and when the story ends, it's always a really happy ending uh, <laughs> as far as I learned. And so, as long as it continues to be a happy ending, you know, we just continue to to um, elect to do those struggles. If the struggles were forced upon us, it wouldn't be the same thing, you know, then that just, that's stress. And, you know, if I'm going to be stressed out all the time, I'll get a job in a corporate environment where I just do what you tell me to do. But as long as the story is good at the end, that's all that really matters. I oh like that. gosh. I like that it's like a perfect way to, to end. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Always good to talk to you guys. Oh, thank you again so, so much. Yep. You guys take care. We'll talk again soon. Later. Bye.